It is said that history is perceived memory, which is another way of saying, let's not let the facts get in the way of a good story. Having said that, though, a culture's self-perception, its national myth, factually inaccurate though it may be, is nevertheless as legitimate a part of a nation's historical narrative as facts and figures. We will encounter other such national myth-defining musical works throughout this survey. For example, we'll examine Hector Berlioz's over-the-top arrangement of the French anthem La Marseillaise as an example of French triumphalism inspired by the three glorious days, the July Revolution of 1830. We'll observe how and why Aaron Copland's spare, angular, widely spaced melodies became emblematic of America's wide open spaces and representative of the mythological American hero, the strong, silent, upright, and self-reliant American pioneer. History and Music, the premise. In Self-Reliance and Other Essays, the always quotable Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, and I quote, the true poem is the poet's mind. The true ship is the shipbuilder. In the man, we should see the reason for the last flourish and tendril of his work, unquote. The true poem is the poet's mind. The true ship is the shipbuilder. Yes, to which we would add, the true musical composition is the composer. For our information, in this same collection of essays, Emerson scolds me for quoting him as a source. Quote, man is timid and apologetic. He is no longer upright. He dares not say, I think I am, but quotes some saint or sage. Unquote. Well, yeah, I stand guilty as charged, though I remain grateful to you, Mr. Emerson, for helping me make my point. That point, a musical composition like Emerson's poet and shipwright, a musical composition is its composer. The creator and his or her creation are not divisible. A creation, whatever it might be, is to some unique degree a reflection of its creator, who in turn is shaped by the time and place in which he lives. The individual composer, an individual composition, a particular time and place. Together, they constitute a symbiotic, indivisible trifecta, an indissoluble menage a trois. At the most general level, a composer's environment shapes his musical style. That is, the generalized musical vocabulary and expressive parameters of his work. But sometimes, sometimes, Specific historical events shape the creation and content of a piece of music, and that's what this survey is about. Music written in direct response to contemporary historical events. As such, this will be a course about connections. The connections between composers and historical events, historical events that both shaped those composers' lives and inspired the creation of the works under study. For example, in one lecture, we will focus on the events surrounding the composition of a piano sonata entitled October 1st, 1905 by Leo Janáček. It's a magnificent, though relatively unknown work, which is why I'm drawing our attention to it here and now. Janáček was born and lived in Moravia, which is today the eastern region of the Czech Republic. Janáček, who was born in 1854 and died in 1928, was a rabid Czech slash Moravian nationalist. It was a nationalism intensified by occupation. At the time he grew up, all Czech lands, including Moravia, were controlled, were occupied by a German-speaking ruling class, by Austrians and Germans. October 1st, 1905, was composed in response to an anti-German protest on October 1st and 2nd, 1905, in Brno, the capital of Moravia. During the protest, German troops attacked the unarmed protesters and killed a 20-year-old Moravian carpenter named Frantisek Pavlik. Janáček's sonata is cast in two movements. The first movement is entitled The Presentiment, 
And the second movement is entitled The Death. In order to provide historical context for the protest that inspired Janáček's sonata, our discussion is going to range all over the temporal map. It will start with the German dismantling of Czechoslovakia in 1938 and 39, and the brutality suffered by the Czechs during the Second World War, and the revenge exacted on the German-speaking Czech minority after the war. The lecture will then range backwards to 1918 and 1919 to observe the creation of the sovereign state of Czechoslovakia from what had been the Austrian Empire, and then even further back to the forcible Germanization of Czech lands in the 1620s and 1630s. Finally, it will move on to the Czech national revival of the 19th century, which so powerfully affected Janáček and his music. That's a lot of ground to cover, but cover it we shall. And that's what this course is all about. The deep-rooted connectivity between certain works of music, their composers, and the events that inspired them. As such, it will be as much a history course as a music course. Many, if not most, of the historical events we will study over the course of this survey will be the result of population movement, border conflict, and consequently, changing maps. Our history. What inspires an artist? Beauty, love, faith. But these are not in themselves historical events. So to a large degree, the historical events we will encounter in this survey will be about changing maps, which means about conflict. Conflicts, revolutions, riots, protests create relatively sudden, disruptive change. At its most extreme, conflict means war, the most terrible folly our species can indulge, with the exception of paying full retail, which has never, to my knowledge, inspired a piece of concert music. Perhaps one day I will compose that piece. Wars are both the simplest and most complex of human endeavors. Simplest because they manifest naked aggression on one hand and self-defense on the other. Instincts coded into our DNA through literally billions of years of evolution, a result of our never-ending competition for resources and optimum living environments. War is also the most massive and complex of all human activities, pitting the human, material, and technological wealth of entire nations against each other in scenarios so complex and devastating as to render any other activity insignificant by comparison. For better or worse, the magnified emotion stirred by conflict revolutionary zealotry and nationalist chauvinism, duty and patriotism, belligerence and viciousness, fear and horror, triumph and tragedy, are like mother's milk for artists, authors, and composers, whose creations feed off the energy in their environment like intestinal parasites feeding off the colonic wall. Okay, the parasite thing aside, I just said something important, even like profound. We all know what's wrong with our species. We are violent, selfish, and often very stupid. But, and this is one of the true glories of Homo sapiens, the artists among us are capable of converting even the most horrific of experiences into transcendent and often transcendentally beautiful art. The war poetry of Wilfred Owen, Pablo Picasso's Guernica, Henrik Goretzky's Symphony No. 3. These are but a few examples of great art rooted in the most terrible of human experiences. Great art that transcends and informs and comes to grip with and finds meaning in the terrible events that inspired it. The fact that we will find artistic beauty in the chaos of conflict should offer great solace for the darker historical events this course will indeed tackle. 